Unit 6.3 Practice Problems. The graphs above show Maxwell Boltzmann distribution for one mole samples of argon. Graph 1 shows the distribution of the particle energies at 300 Kelvin, and graph 2 shows the distribution of particle energies at 600 Kelvin. A student predicts that if the samples are combined in an insulated container and a thermal equilibrium is obtained, then the most probable uh, particle energy will be between the most probable probable energy of graph 1 and most probable energy of graph 2. Which of the following is the best justification for the student's claim? So we are saying that if we were to combine these two samples when they reach equilibrium, we will end up with something in the middle between these two uh, graphs. And uh, that is going to be due to the collisions of the particles that are within these containers and that is going to redistribute the overall energy of uh, each container into some sort of net um, equilibrium. So looking through our options we're going to look for something similar to that Option choice A says when the samples are combined, the gas particles will collide with one another, with the net effect being that the speed of the lowest energy particles decreases while the speed of the highest energy particles increases, leaving the average speed of the particles of the original samples unchanged. So that is th basically the exact opposite of what we just said was going to happen. Um, if I collide, I'm going to end up giving energy to the particles that were lower energy to begin with and um, uh, taking away energy from uh, particles that had an excess amount of it. Option choice B says when the samples are combined, the gas particles from each sample will collide with the gas particles from the other sample until every particle in the mixture has the same speed. Um, which is between the average speeds of the particles in the hotter sample and the average speeds of the particles in the cooler sample. So from uh, the original distribution, we can see that not every single particle has the same speed. Instead, um, we are left with an overall average speed, not, uh, not just uh, everybody having the exact same speed, so no. When the samples are combined, the gas particles collide with one another until every particle in the mixture has the same kinetic energy. Again, uh, this is going to be immediately uh, disregarded. Um, we have a, uh, a wide range of energies, and we have like an overall average energy, but not everybody has the exact same energy. We don't just have a spike. Uh, with no curve at all. So option choice C is also going to be eliminated, leaving me with D that says when the samples are combined, the gas particles will collide with one another, with the net effect being that the energy will be transferred from the more energetic particles to the less energetic particles until the new distribution of energies is achieved at a temperature between 300 and 600 Kelvin. So uh, that is uh, that matches what we were predicting that we would end up uh, giving energy from the high energy particles to low energy particles and that uh, we will eventually kind of reach an equili equilibrium where we end up with something in between 300 and 600. A student adds 50 grams of liquid water at 25 degrees Celsius to an insulated container fitted with a temperature probe. The student then adds 10 grams of ice at zero degrees Celsius, closes the container, and measures the temperature at different intervals. Part of the data is shown in the graph above. The student predicts that the temperature will continue to decrease, then level out to a constant temperature. Which of the following best explains why the student's, predictions, uh, why the student's prediction is correct? So we had a sample of water that was at 25 degrees Celsius and then a sample of ice at zero degrees Celsius. The sample of ice uh, is smaller than the sample of water. So uh, 
we are we are going to be closer to the 25 degrees Celsius temperature than the zero degrees Celsius temperature. However, um, we are looking for an answer choice that says something along the lines of that uh, the water molecules and the ice molecules are going to uh, collide, sharing energy, and then um, eventually uh, they will equal out and have the same average kinetic energy and the same temperature. Uh, option choice one says uh, the water molecules initially in the ice and the water molecules initially in the liquid will have the same average kinetic energy. This is talking about why we would reach a constant temperature. Um, this is okay. Let's see if there's anything that's any better. The temperature, sorry, the transfer of energy between uh, water molecules in the ice and liquid stops once all the molecules are in the liquid phase. Uh, that would in involve uh, me no longer having any collisions at all. That's the only way that we can have any complete stoppage of um, energy transfer, and we know that that's not going to be the case, so that's gonna be eliminated. Once all the uh, water molecules are in the liquid phase, the individual molecular speeds either increases or decrease until all particles have the same speed. Particles are not going to all have the same speed. They're going to have an average speed, but not every single particle is going to be going at the exact same speed, so no. Once all water molecules are in the liquid phase, collisions between them virtually stop as they reach an equilibrium distance from their uh, neighboring molecules. No, we continue to have collisions um, even when uh, we have reached an average or a, uh, an equilibrium. So that's going to be eliminated as well. Leaving me with answer choice A being the uh, only answer choice that uh, makes sense. A piece of iron at 25 degrees Celsius is placed into water at 75 degrees Celsius in an insulated container. A student predicts that the thermal equilibrium is reached that when the thermal equilibrium is reached, the iron atoms being more massive than the water molecules will have a higher kinetic, average kinetic energy than the water molecules. Uh, which of the following best explains why the student's prediction is incorrect? So um, this is going to be incorrect because the thermal energy is um, directly related to the kinetic energy. And so once they uh, reach their equilibrium and they, they are all at the same temperature, they are going to have uh, the same uh, thermal energy and therefore we can extrapolate out into being the same kinetic energy. So we'll look for something along those lines. Option choice A says at thermal equilibrium, the less massive water molecules would have a higher average kinetic energy than the iron molecules because they are more free to move than the iron um, atoms. Again, no, um, we are going to have uh, the same kinetic energy if we are at the same thermal um, energy. At thermal equilibrium, the collisions between iron atoms and water molecules would cease because the average kinetic energy of so the particles would become the same. Again, no, collisions still happen. At thermal equilibrium, the movement of both iron atoms and water molecules would cease, thus the average kinetic energy of the particles would be have to be the same. No, again, we have to continue having uh, collisions. And then answer choice D says, at thermal equilibrium, the average kinetic energy of the iron atoms cannot be greater than that of the water molecules the average kinetic energies must be the same according to the definition of thermal equilibrium. That is going to be our best answer choice. Again, uh, the thermal energy and the kinetic energy are interlinked. And so if we have the same thermal energy, then we are going to have the same kinetic energy. A 100 gram sample of a metal was heated to 100 degrees Celsius and then quickly transferred to an insulated container holding 100 grams of water at 22 degrees Celsius. The temperature of the water rose to reach a final temperature of 35 degrees Celsius. Which of the following can be concluded? Uh, the metal temperature changed more than the water temperature did. Therefore, the metal lost more thermal energy than the water gained. So let's see. So we have, um, 
100 gram samples of both um, the metal and of water. And uh, the metal is going from 100 down to 35. And then the water is going from uh, 22 up to 35. Okay, so um, the metal temperature did change more than the water did. However, the specific heat and the resistance to temperature change um, that water has uh, doesn't mean that there was actually less energy involved. So that's not a great answer. The metal temperature changed more than the water temperature did, but the metal lost the same amount of energy as the of thermal energy as the water gained. Um, this is going to be uh, a very good answer. Um, whatever is lost by one system has to be gained by another. And so again, water has a very high specific heat, meaning that it has a very high resistance to changing its overall temperature. And uh, while metal has a very uh, low specific heat, it's a very good thermal conductor, meaning if you put it in something that is cold, it will become cold very quickly. Water uh, resists that change as long as possible. However, the amount of energy that is taken to change uh, the water is the energy that was given off by the metal. So that is a good answer choice. Let's see if there's anything better. Answer choice C says the metal temperature changed more than the water temperature did. Therefore, the heat capacity of the metal must be greater than the heat capacity of water. Uh, this is the exact opposite of the case. Um, we were able to uh, change the metal's uh, temperature much easier, and that was shown by the much larger change in temperature. D is the final temperature is less than the average starting temperature of the metal and the water. Therefore, the total energy of the metal and water decreased. Uh, that is not true. The water increased in temperature, so uh, no. Okay, so answer choice B is the only answer choice that matches our uh, understanding of thermodynamics. The equation above represents the decomposition of the compound XY uh, sub 2. The diagram below shows the react, uh, reaction profiles, path 1 and path 2, for the decomposition of XY sub 2. We have path 1 and path 2. And um, we are given here, which of the following best describes the flow of heat when one mole of uh, that compound uh, decomposes? So when we decompose, uh, we have uh, initially a lower energy state than uh, post decomposition. So we have uh, increased our potential energy from, uh, from our initial state. So we have a delta H that is positive, meaning that this is going to be endothermic meaning that I am going to take in energy from the surrounding area. So um, I am just going to be measuring from the final state and the initial state. And so this number here, the 50 kilojoules per mole, is the number that I am interested in. And it is only uh, one mole that is uh, decomposing, and so I'm not going to change that number at all. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of answer choices C and D, because those answer choices do not um, reflect the amount of energy uh, that would be absorbed. And uh, so then I am going to look at option choice A and B. So option choice A says 50 kilojoules of heat is transferred to the surroundings. This is stating that this is exothermic, meaning that the delta H is negative. And we know that it is endothermic because we have a higher energy uh, than we started with. And so we are going to be transferred from the surroundings to the sample of, um, of X and Y when we decompose.